Oops. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, it's great to see so many people on such a dreary day. And, um, <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for choosing that architecture-related music. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard the, the expression that architecture is frozen music. Absolutely. So that's <laughs> very, very <laughs> apropos. Um, so yes, I did want to I, I did want to talk about uh, a subject that I think covers a lot of ground. Um, and when we talk about cities today, um, there's probably no word that stirs more passion than this word density. Uh, there's also no word that is more understood, misunderstood, um, or scarier, <laughs> uh, since this is that time of year. Um, to some, density means the number of human beings uh, who live in a certain area. Uh, to others, density doesn't refer to people at all, but to the size and the number of buildings. Building size and population density are correlated but they're not the same thing. Um, so some of the some of the biggest new buildings in New York City right now are these so-called pencil towers, and many of them are nearly empty. They've become these giant piggy banks for wealthy investors, uh, especially from overseas, a safe place to park their money. Uh, that's not density. Um, Density isn't just about size and numbers, and I wanted to talk about this subject today because the conversation about density goes to the heart of the most crucial issues of our day. Climate change, economic inequality, housing affordability, racial justice, the livability of our cities. We need density for several reasons. Uh, if we have any hope of saving our planet, uh, we're gonna have to limit our use of fossil fuels. And that means reducing our dependence on private automobiles. And the only way to do that is to change the way that people travel. We're going to have to switch to transit, to bikes, to walking, and do that on a large scale. Those modes are really only feasible if people live in compact areas where transit is efficient. Um, transit doesn't work in, in you know, farmland where people live far apart. So to create these walkable, transit-oriented places, we need to densify our, our neighborhoods. Another reason uh, that density is a hot topic is because the cost of housing is becoming increasingly unaffordable, not just for the poor, but for people who, who think of themselves as middle class. Many towns, uh, particularly the suburbs, are actively limiting the supply of housing right now. Uh, and they're doing that by limiting the allowable density. And not only does this increase the cost of housing, it often keeps out minorities, uh, it keeps out diversity, it closes the door to people who hope to improve their lot in life, uh, and it does this by restricting access to, to good schools and to good amenities. For all this, I want you to know that I am not actually a density zealot. Uh, you probably heard the term YIMBY, which means yes in my backyard. Um, it's the opposite of NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard. Uh, and YIMBYs believe that there should be virtually no restrictions on housing construction. Not for historic preservation, not for uh, neighborhood preservation. Uh, and they sometimes call themselves market urbanists. Uh, because they believe if you increase the supply of new housing, ultimately the cost of housing Will decline. So I am not a Yimmy. Um, I'm, and, and the reason I'm not is because I, I believe in maintaining livable, walkable neighborhoods like the one right outside the door here. Um, and I believe that architecture is, is one of the great products of civilization and there's enormous value in being surrounded by beautiful buildings that have evolved over time. Uh, I love new buildings but uh, I feel that they should be integrated into what already exists. Um, it's also more sustainable to keep what we have. Um, but I'm not a NIMBY either, um, and I believe uh, what we need is density that is thoughtful. Let's call it right size density. So, um, right across the street, um, there's a building going up that's going to be very, very big. Um, and I thought we would look at some different types of buildings and their relative densities. 
Uh, this building on the other side of Rittenhouse Square is called the Laurel, um, and it's going to be the one of the tallest residential buildings in Philadelphia, 565 feet tall. Uh, interestingly, it is twice the height of the plaza, which is the, the building right next to it you see in the picture. Um, uh, but because this is such an affluent part of town, um, the apartments will be pretty big, and even though this building is so big, uh, it won't have all that many apartments, uh, just 240 um, in a 565 foot tall building. So let's say there's an average of two people per apartment, which is kind of a high estimate today. Um, that's 480 pe people. Um, the site is one acre, so that's 480 people per acre. Um, that's actually not many more than the number of people who live in Ten Rittenhouse, House, which is at the other end of the block. Um, that building is only 400 feet tall. Um, so the difference, 165 feet, um, why is one building so much taller than the other? Because people really prioritize high ceilings now, and um, so the ceiling heights are, are, are higher, but there aren't necessarily more floors. Um, Anyway, so you get a much bigger building, but the same number of people as smaller buildings. Um, so that, that's a, an interesting um, trend in, in density right now. Um, here's another form of density. Um, 1,100 houses are planned for this 30-acre site on the Delaware waterfront just north of Fishtown. And um, it's a really great site for housing. Um, well, great waterfront views, um, but unfortunately the transit is not all that good and everyone who lives there will probably have a car. Uh, so although that looks like a lot of houses, um, my calculation is that there will be only 73 people to the acre as compared to that tower, where I, or remember I said 480. Um, so it's much less dense than one tall building uh, on Rittenhouse Square. Um, Still, it's better than a typical suburb. Uh, my hometown, I grew up in Levittown, the old original Levittown in, in New York, the first one. Um, and um, in a you know, typical suburban house, um, with, I have a brother, um, so it was two parents and, and two kids. Um, and by my very generous calculation for the density of, that, of, of Levittown is that there were um, eight to 10 people per acre. Um, that's actually more than some of the newer, very affluent suburbs um, where houses are built on, on a half acre or one acre lots. Um, so um, it's better than some. Um, but um, then there are places like the main line, um, like this is in Lower Marion, uh, which, which are still home to huge estates. Uh, this is the Dorrance estate. Uh, it's on 70 acres, uh, beautiful. Um, and we can reasonably assume, I think, that there, there are less than one person per acre um, <laughs> in, uh, on this property. Uh, it's interesting, this Lower Marion, which you know, does have some progressive policies, um, recently adopted a new zoning code. Um, and it's designed to actually restrict um, growth and, and lower the density. And they, they designed the zoning so that instead of being potentially able to build enough housing for 90,000 people. They changed the zoning so you can only now potentially build enough housing for 70,000 people. That means 20,000 people fewer will get to live in Lower Marion. And one of their arguments, which I, I, I do find, I am a little bit sympathetic to, is um, Lower Marion is kind of like um, a tale of two towns because one half, uh, the part closer to Philly is actually fairly dense and it has great train service. Um, and the other half, where, where this mansion is, 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 is less, much less dense and um, very green. And, and their thinking was that they, they would increase density in the already dense part and they would uh, not allow any new construction in the green part in, in the interest of preserving green space, which is not such a bad idea. Um, uh, and I just wanted to show you uh, two more comparisons. Um, the picture on the left is Hong Kong and Paris on the right. Um, they're both pretty dense, right? 
so which is more dense? Um, does anybody want to take a guess? Um, uh, actually, it's Paris, believe it or not. Um, and it's, and Paris is one of the, one of the ten most dense cities in, in the world, uh, despite having very few high rises. Um, it's not really a fair comparison because if any of you have been to Hong Kong, you know that it's, it's a territory, not just a city. And um, it actually has tremendous amounts of green space. So a lot of times density depends on where you draw the circle. Uh, so maybe Hong Kong would come out to be more dense if you just did the, the urbanized part um, that we mostly know. Um, and yet, you know, as dense as these two cities are, they're both struggling with housing affordability. It's, it's really hard to, 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 to live in these two places. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, are following the, the protests in Hong Kong. And, and one of the things that's driving them uh, is the lack of affordable housing. People live in tiny, tiny spaces. Um, so, you know, all, all of these issues um, that are facing our world are, are interrelated. Um, so what is the ideal density for a city? Um, is, it, is, it, is Paris style density better than Hong Kong style density? Um, is there room for Lower Marion style density? Maybe a better way to pose this question since we're here in Philadelphia uh, is this. Um, can we enjoy the benefits uh, and social good that density brings while still preserving the things that make Philadelphia special, uh, like its pleasant human scale, its friendly neighborhoods, its walkability. Uh, in other words, can we have density and maintain neighborhood character? Americans have always been deeply suspicious of density, and I think this is partly to do with our, our Jeffersonian heritage. Uh, Thomas Jefferson imagined America as this agrarian utopia, and he was deeply distrustful of big cities. And so we have this built-in preference for individualism over the commons, for the private over the public. And over the last 250 years, we've been conditioned to pre prefer to live spread out in single-family homes, preferably with a front lawn, a driveway, a fence, um, connected by interstate highways rather than public transit. Um, all you have to do is propose a medium-sized apartment building, and all of a sudden, people are out and forced to oppose it. Um, this project's not that big in height. Um, it's not the Laurel, um, but um, it's, it's a project in, in Ardmore on Lancaster Avenue, and um, it's an easy walk from the Ardmore train station. Um, and it would replace a car dealership and a very large parking lot. Uh, and, and people have gotten, um, people in, in, in this area are really, really up in arms about it. They think it's too dense. Um, yet, here, here we have Lower Marion trying to do this balance between density around transit um, and preserving green space. Everybody's in favor of preserving green space, but they don't want to acknowledge that the cost of doing that is building denser in places that are already dense. So, um, I mean, part of the problem is that there are single-family homes right near this project, uh, and, and it is a, you know, a step up in height, um, but it would allow more people to live in the neighborhood. Maybe, maybe people who live in parts of Philadelphia where um, they don't have access to good schools could move to Lower Marion and send their kids to one of the best school districts in the country. Um, it, it would create those options. It would create options for young people who can't afford to buy. They could live in an apartment. So there are many, many benefits to this. And because it is on Lancaster Avenue, which is a commercial street, uh, it doesn't seem like it would you know, terribly harm that neighborhood's character. Um, not all NIMBYs are in the suburbs, by the way. Um, this is Society Hill, it's Fifth Street. Uh, a couple years ago, that neighborhood went nuclear over uh, a proposal by a developer to build a very similar five-story apartment building. Um, it would have replaced this one-story supermarket and parking lot. Um, people said there were no tall buildings in the neighborhood. I, I see tall buildings. That picture, <laughs> um, but anyway, that's what they claimed. Um, and and because it is a very wealthy, affluent, well 
impact a neighborhood, they, they got their council person to um, make it impossible for the developer to, to build on that site. Um, you know, but honestly, you know, I, I don't want to single out the Society Hill because their, their response is not much different from a response you often hear in, um, you know, lower income sections of North Philadelphia. Um, over the last two decades, the Philadelphia Housing Authority has systematically reduced the density of its projects by replacing high-rise buildings with, with low-rise developments. This actually started during the Clinton administration when cities like Philadelphia were still hemorrhaging population. Uh, and, and the high-rise public housing projects were, were blamed for a host of social ills, for crime, for poverty, for alienation. You know, and they, they were pretty bad places um, for a whole host of reasons. They weren't maintained. Um, and so during that period, during the Clinton administration, um, a lot of money was spent to, to um, get rid of those uh, high rises and replace them with um, lower density public housing. Uh, and it's, there's no doubt, I think, that um, the lower density housing that we've seen uh, is a much better fit in, in the neighborhoods, particularly in Philadelphia. Um, but now, 20 years later, 20 years after demolishing 22 public housing towers, Philadelphia doesn't have enough affordable housing for its poorest citizens. Um, so um, this, is a, this is an image of um, the Philadelphia Housing Authority's latest plan for a neighborhood called Sharswood in, in, in North Philadelphia. It's just uh, north of Girard Avenue. And I just want to call your attention um, not to the, row house, to the row houses, but um, the parking lots. Um, and, and, and there's a, there's a tower, I think it's, um, it's, on, it's, it's on the right. Um, that's the one tower that survived the implosion and it's been turned into a senior citizen uh, apartment building. Um, and there's just a lot of wasted space compared with uh, our older row house blocks and a lot of it is, um, is used for parking, but it's like a lot of it is just wasted because they didn't exactly know what to do with it. Um, so technically, you know, there's one high rise there. Um, it has just 84 apartments and lots and lots of ground around it. And I doubt if there are 50 people to the acre. And, and meanwhile, you know, people are clamoring for this kind of housing. We just don't have enough of it. Um, so here's some context. Um, Number, more numbers, I'm giving you a lot of numbers. Um, you know, by American standards, Philadelphia is a relatively dense city, um, even though most of us live in what is uh, technically single family homes, the row house. Uh, the row house is a pretty compact and efficient form. I actually think it's kind of the best of both worlds. You can have density, you can have your own home. Um, Philadelphia has uh, 11,700 11, people to the square mile. That's about half of what New York has, which is uh, 28,000. But it is significantly more than LA, which has 8,400 people um, to the square mile. And it's four times what, um, what the density of Houston is. Um, and you can see, this, this is a really interesting graphic, where the cities are, um, the other cities are superimposed on, on the map of Philadelphia uh, to show their relative densities. Look at Manila. <laughs> How many vanillas can we get in Philadelphia? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, people are so uneasy with density in Philadelphia, given that it used to be a much denser city. Uh, at our peak, we had a population of 2.2 million people. Imagine what, like, you could never get a reservation in a restaurant on a Saturday night if, you, if, if we had 2.2 million people today. Um, like most American cities, uh, Philadelphia saw its population plunge after World War II. And so many people left during the 60s, 70s, and 80s that some officials believed that the only way to save cities like Philadelphia was to de-densify them and to make them more like suburbs. Um, these houses were built uh, in the 90s in North Philadelphia, uh, very close to that other development I showed you. Um, they're just actually just north of Ridge Avenue, very close to Broad Street, uh, 
pretty good transit, I would say. Uh, mostly buses, but you can walk to the subway. Um, and then, then it's three stops to City Hall. You know, what, what a great location. Um, yet, you know, they're built like suburban houses, and everyone has, has cars. And they were built when our population hit, hit rock bottom, and no one, no one believed that we were going to start gaining population again. Um, but in fact, we did. Um, uh, the last 20 years have been an incredible uh, transformation for Philadelphia. Um, the city's fortunes began to turn around. Um, uh, the population began to grow again, slowly at first, and then more vigorously. We've seen a lot of immigrants uh, settle here. Um, what turned around, though, uh, what, what didn't turn around was mimicking the suburbs. Um, Philadelphia became an attractive place, sorry. Uh, Philadelphia became an attractive place to live because, precisely because of its density, because it was a walkable place. And I always find it interesting that um, the first year of Philadelphia's population increase was 2007. That happens to be the year that the iPhone first came on the market, and I, and I think they're, they're related. Uh, events. The iPhone enabled sort of the social media revolution. It changed how we socialize. It changed how we move through space. We're always looking at our phones, right? Um, but not just that. Um, you know, you didn't need a car. Now you can call a ride hailing service. Um, you can have bike sharing and car sharing. Um, uh, it led to millennials pr prioritizing their phones over their cars. I have a 26-year-old daughter. She has refused to learn how to drive. I can give it up on her. She would never learn how to drive. Um, but thanks to the growth in the population in Philadelphia, um, quite a number of our declining neighborhoods, mainly in the ring around Center City, have uh, come back to life. And it's made these places safer and more pleasant. Uh, we have more restaurants, more stores, more amenities. Um, we feel safer, there's less crime, uh, and we use our public spaces more intensively. Um, of course, you know, we've seen this gentrification as well. People have been displaced and forced to, to move further from the center. Um, but uh, scholars like uh, Edward Glazer of Harvard uh, would argue that cities um, are America's economic engines because of density. This density allows people to come together, like, like we are here, to share ideas and um, to brainstorm, and that helps um, you know, people be creative and come up with new ways of thinking, uh, new businesses. Um, the new jobs that are created in cities um, have provided the city with tax revenue to fund the schools and to fund other services to build parks. Um, and of course, Philadelphia's transit system, flawed, flawed as it is, could not exist without the current level of density. So, um, you know, why do people get so worked up when, uh, for example, a five-story building is proposed? And I think a lot of that has to do with change. Um, when, we come, when we come to a place uh, that already has big buildings, we simply incorporate them into our mental image of that place. And I think of the, the Carlisle apartment building on Locust Street, which is also very close to here. Um, I'm sure you never give it a thought. Um, and we, you know, I think there's a good reason we find this building more tolerable than um, some other tall buildings. And that's because it's built with the same materials as the lower buildings nearby. Um, I think another reason, um, that is less offensive is that it has no parking garage. Um, you know, when you walk by, it's just like walking by a house. Um, there, there's a lobby, there are people coming in and out. Um, it feels the same, so you don't really think about how tall it is, even though it's in the middle of the block, which is uh, usually not the ideal place for the tallest structures. We like them on the corners to allow everything to breathe. Um, so th this is this is an image of what you get when you uh, when, when you exceed to the car. You, you get a tower built on a parking garage that makes it even taller. Um, 
You know, people often complain that density causes congestion, and they're not all wrong. Um, we love the vitality associated with cities, yet we all insist that our new buildings um, mimic suburban levels of parking. Um, but, you know, when you include parking into a building like this, you can't possibly get a good design. Um, it takes away from the urbanity of the design, um, even when that parking is placed underground. You still need driveways. The driveways cross the sidewalk. They interfere with pedestrians walking down the street. Um, <coughs> you always see those ugly ramps down into the underground garage. And the other thing uh, parking does is it, it occupies space on the ground floor, which you could have space for people instead of cars. You could have shops. You could have you know, a gym. You could have um, some kind of active use. Um, one of the things we are seeing in Philadelphia is that um, density is not always uh, spread evenly throughout the city. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about this runaway building boom, but in fact, most of the construction is happening only in a, a very small number of neighborhoods in Center City and, 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 and South Philadelphia, and now West Philadelphia, and, and, and the corridor along the Market Frankfurt line. Um, in other words, it's happening in places that have Transit, transit and density really go together. Um, so because de developers are so eager to build in those few neighborhoods, uh, they're going to extreme lengths to cram buildings in. Um, land is, is increasingly hard to find in those neighborhoods, and they're capitalizing what's there, uh, including some of our most precious places and the very thing that makes Philadelphia such a livable city. I've, I've written a lot about this project on Jewelers Row, um, where Toll Brothers is squeezing a 26-story condo tower onto the site of five very handsome buildings, um, some of which are, are pretty old, going back to the uh, early 1800s. Um, it's quite a different uh, effect from the Carlisle. Um, there's no attempt to blend it into the na neighborhood. I think that's one of the reasons it's so offensive. Uh, it sticks out so much. Um, you know, there's a lot of good things about glass, but, um, you know, people, do, architects will always say, oh, it's going to disappear into the sky. It never disappears into the sky. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it stands out. Um, we've also seen attempts to increase density without destroying the city's older fabric um, by adding new floors to the top of the existing buildings. And, and I generally think this is a good trend. Um, people call them overbuilds. Um, this one is at 16th and Market. It was the, um, the lower part you might recognize was a, a, a building called Brown Brothers Harriman. I think it was a, a kind of investment bank. Um, and then a developer put um, a couple more floors on the top and they tried to match the color of the original building. And um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's not so bad. Um, but then there are others that I think stand out like sore thumbs. And I, I wasn't uh, crazy about this one, which is also on Walnut Street, um, just west of 21st Street. And um, uh, it's very, very different. It, it's, uh, the glass is different from the masonry of the historic buildings. And then uh, it has this really unfortunate firewall, which you, you can see down uh, a small street off of uh, 22nd. Um, the reason they did that is because um, they didn't know who was going to build next door and they didn't want to put any windows, so they got this horrific, huge blank wall. Um, I think if they had made it like a dark color, it would have been better. Um, anyway, what, what are the reasons um, uh, we're seeing this kind of stuff? It's because um, it is so difficult to get permission to build new five-story buildings in Society Hill and other places. If, if we could build, you know, if we could build where we have surface lots and fill them in, perhaps there would be less of this like uh, frenzy to 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 build um, uh, these overbuilds. Um, another, you know, in addition, another another thing we're seeing in addition to get to get more units is um, basement apartments, and you can tell these are basement apartments because of the, the way the entrances are. 
Uh, and it's, it's really hard to believe in, in 2019 that um, there's been a huge, huge increase in basement apartments. Now, theoretically, there will be windows in them and people will have light. Um, but um, there is such a demand for housing that um, people are willing to live underground. Um, this has had some serious consequences because it requires digging uh, quite a deep foundation, not everyone is up to the task, and we've seen quite a few uh, building collapses caused by the, the neighboring buildings having their foundations undermined. Um, this is all about density uh, in these high demand neighborhoods. Um, here's another example. Um, the building on the right, the stone building, is, is an old church in, in West Philadelphia, and it had a very charming little garden it still has a charming little garden, um, but a developer bought it, wanted to tear it down, finally agreed to save it, but as a condition of saving the church and, and turning it into apartments, um, he, did, he said he, he had a certain number of apartments he had to have, and in order to do that, he wants to build in that garden. Um, so that neighborhood will, will lose this little spot of green, which is kind of like a respite when you walk down the street. And um, that building will also have um, underground apartments. Um, um, so at least that will create more housing for people. Um, this project in Fiddler Square, which is a really crazy project, um, really illustrates the divergence between height and density. Uh, the new homes on the right are six stories tall. They all have elevators. Um, the houses on the, on the left are, you know, traditional fully row houses. They're, they're three, three and a half stories. Um, the new houses, will, I, I, I suspect, won't have any more people living in them than the old houses. People really, they want to mimic suburban McMansions in the city, so they're building really big. Now, I, I live in this neighborhood, and I, I would not have any trouble with a 65-foot tall building uh, on that site, which in fact was zoned, um, it was zoned to have a mid-rise apartment building on it. Uh, so you could have built um, flats, apartments, on the same site, same height as these six-story houses, and, and house many more people. Um, again, making it possible for, for renters to live in a neighborhood with a, with a good school, good transit, good amenities. Um, here's a trend I, I like better, more overbuilds. Um, people do want more space, I, I, I understand that. Um, so what we're seeing in a lot of two-story two houses around Center City uh, is they're now so valuable that um, it's worth adding a third floor um, to get an extra bedroom. And um, you know, I think that's okay if it allows families to stay in the city. Um, so, um, and we're seeing just an explosion of, the, of these overbills. Um, that is part of American life, I guess. Um, here's some more. Um, not quite as well done. Um, I always felt like these were like Jersey Shore houses that they air dropped in. <laughs> so, um, I've showed you a lot of different forms of density, and you know I've tried to develop uh, some rules of thumb about you know when does it make sense uh, to have density, and um, I just wanted to you know these are, these are Inga's rules of thumb, <laughs> uh, and you can uh, reject them or accept them. Um, so I think you you should build densely when you have good transit, um, so people don't need to own cars, um, but you have to create the zoning that actively discourages cars, or you will get horrible car-oriented garages. Um, so this is a, this new development on East Market Street, where they have two very large apartment buildings, and um, it was built, uh, it, it replaced a, a, a two-story building, um, the old Stellenberg's department store, and I think that's a pretty good place for density. Um, Okay. 
Well, more rules of thumb. Um, so another good place for density is um, uh, is on a wide street, again, like Market or Broad Street, because um, if you're going to build a tall building, uh, you you want you don't want to cap it. I think I think that's fine. And as I said, we there are buildings like that already here, and we just don't think about them. Our eyes become accustomed to seeing them. So, so now the other side. Um, we hear a lot from EMBs that we are in the midst of an affordability crisis, and this statement is repeated over and over again, and it has come to take on a ring of truth. Um, Adam Gottmann in The New Yorker just recently wrote a lengthy essay about it. Um, uh, there are problems. The problem is that there are still cities, and Philadelphia is one of them, where you can buy or rent a house for a song. I mean, not, not in Center City, um, not in, you know, West, West Philadelphia, close to Center City, uh, not in Fishtown, but in other places. Um, Philadelphia still has neighborhoods where property values are declining. Um, where, you know, they would love to see gentrification because things are just getting worse in those neighborhoods. Um, so, yes, many people have been priced out of attractive downtown neighborhoods, um, but that's not the same thing as an affordability crisis. Um, a lot of people here, I know, prefer to say Philadelphia doesn't have an affordability crisis, it has a poverty crisis. Um, so if we could solve that, um, then maybe, you know, housing would be easier. Um, but those, those are reasons to think wisely about density. Um, we need density overall, but that doesn't mean we need density everywhere, and we don't need the same density everywhere. We need to be smart about density. Um, we certainly don't want to destroy the things that make our neighborhoods comfortable places to live. So here are the last two thoughts I, I, I would leave you with. Um, the first is that I think that most neighborhoods can handle more density than they think they can. And the other is that there isn't just one kind of density, there are many densities, and we need to pick the right one for, the, for, the, for each place. Okay. Thank you very much.